Happy belated Malaysia Day! That warm, fuzzy feeling when you think of Malaysia right now? That's patriotism. But too much of it could actually lead to this. Okay, wait, let me explain. Okay, let's talk patriotism, which, fun fact, comes from the word patria, the Latin word for country. It essentially means having love or loyalty towards your own country. The first known historical record of this concept was from Roman times, when they spoke Latin. Roman citizens placed a high value on the love of law and common liberty, the search for the common good, and the duty to behave justly towards your country. Niccolo Machiavelli, the famous 15th century philosopher, also wrote about patriotism. He equates it with the love for liberty and writes that it helps people resist tyranny and corruption. But philosophy aside, patriotic feelings are often quite natural to humans. Here's why. Now the reason why people have patriotism is linked to things like the need to belong to something bigger than themselves, as well as the need for security. So feeling like I relate to my country to some extent, or I can trust my government and I believe in my government, allows people to feel like the government will also have their backs in times when they need safety or security. The great thing about patriotism is that it incentivizes people to work together for the greater good of the country. The more people feel like they're connected to their country in a constructive way, the more likely they are to engage in activities that are aimed towards helping the country develop further. You also see higher rates of civic engagement, so in terms of voting, uh, civil rights advocacy and that kind of thing. Patriotism actually stems from the very human desire to form communities. Researchers have found that people tend to cluster into groups and think of their own circles or cliques as the in-group. Everyone else is the out-group. In the 1970s, a British social psychologist named Henry Touchville found that the groups we identify with provide an essential sense of identity and belonging. According to his research, social groups help us make sense of the world and our place in it. On a nuclear level, that's our families. On a slightly larger scale, football clubs. On a national scale, that feeling of loyalty to a group or a cause translates to patriotism. But there is a dark side to patriotism. Scholars have broken patriotism down into different types. And while the terminology isn't always the same, the general consensus is that there are two forms of patriotism. Simply put, this type of patriotism is where people love the country enough to want to make it better. Citizens would work to make policies better, prioritize the collective good, and try to be more inclusive. This type of patriotism is seen as negative. Citizens would support the country no matter what, and that's not always a good thing. On top of that, these patriots tend to fear outgroups. When it comes to blind patriotism, that's more sort of a blind attachment to the symbols of your country, such as, you know, your flag, the king, sort of national anthem, all of these things that we think make up what being Malaysian is. And anything that threatens these symbols make people with blind patriotism very angry. They have an unquestioning positive regard for what it means to be Malaysian, and it's a very rigid and inflexible sort of definition. This all sounds very similar to another concept called nationalism. It's similar, but not the same. If people believe that what makes up my country is also tied to my ethnicity, for example, then it's possible for things like ethnic nationalism to arise out of blind patriotism, especially if they feel that other people in the country who are not as ethnically bound to this national identity as I am are being a threat to that identity. Taken to the extreme, patriotism and nationalism can have disastrous consequences. An extreme desire to protect one's own culture or ideology has led to conflict, wars, and genocide. The Holocaust, for example, clearly stemmed from a nationalistic movement. In more modern times, Trump and Brexit are two examples of populations who wanted to close their borders against migrants. Hungary's right-wing nationalistic policies barred refugees from entering the country during the 2015 European refugee crisis. Closer to home, Myanmar's majority Buddhist nationalists see Rohingyas as outsiders refusing them citizenship and committing what the UN has called genocide. Hard to believe, but even the most cruel and unjust of these nationalistic policies are often 
very popular among the country's citizens. The reason that nationalism might appeal to so many people is Remember that the need for uh, belonging and need for security underlies sort of patriotism and nationalism to some extent. So one of the reasons why nationalism could be becoming more popular is because people are seeing a greater need to protect their cultures and their traditions from the influences of people coming in from the outside. In the Malaysian context, nationalism has a long history. It was a nationalist movement that first pushed for independence from the British. Yeah, in Malaysia, our history of nation building is quite divisive in the sense that there was initially a strong Malay nationalism. This was born based on a fear factor with the introduction of the Malayan Union plan. And this was seen as a threat to Malay interests and so-called Malay survivors. So UMNO was born. But at the same time, I think UMNO leaders realized that this country actually, you, you can't just build a Malay country because there are so many non-Malays. And they realized also that by collaborating with other ethnic groups, there is benefit to it. So that's how I think alliance have thrived. Yeah? One scholar, Wang Gung Wu, he calls at that time the Malayan nationalism as attenuated Malay nationalism plus non-Malays. It is something that we still need to deal with till now. It is still a very divisive issue. Eventually, UMNO, MCA and MIC, three parties representing the Malays, Chinese and Indians respectively, formed the Community's Liaison Committee, which worked to address the issues faced by both Malays and non-Malays living in the peninsula. It was the first step towards the unity needed to gain independence. When Malaysia was formed in 1963, it was only possible through an agreement to work in partnership for the common good. Now perhaps it's time for us to talk about Malaysian consensus. When we talk about certain issues, we don't see it as a zero-sum game, as a divisive thing, whether you know, Malay agree, but non-Malay don't agree. So that will take political will. I think whether our nation building will succeed, it will depend on whether we manage to enlarge you know, the people who buy in on this multi-ethnic consensus. Similar situations can be seen in the success stories of other countries. Moral of the story, you can protect your community better by making your community bigger. Be inclusive. So this Malaysia Day, let's be proud of what we've achieved as a nation of vastly different communities who agreed to work together for the common good. But let's never stop expanding our borders to be more inclusive. History tells us it's the best way forward.